on your radio, on Global Player, and play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at eight o'clock. The Chancellor says a rise in national insurance introduced in April will be reversed in November. It will save people on average £330 a year. Alfie Sterling from the New Economics Foundation says it's a long-term planning by the Bank of England. They recognise that the current inflation we're seeing in the system is largely driven by energy prices that are global and imported, and the bank can't do a lot about that. What they're trying to do is prevent longer run inflation setting in in the UK economy as a result of things like wage rises and demand increasing. Kwasi Kwarteng will also provide a timeline for an economic forecast during his mini budget on Friday after being criticised for reviews, refusing to publish one earlier. A third rail strike has been announced for next month. The RMT union will walk out on Saturday the 8th of October in a row over pay, jobs and conditions. The train operator Avanti will increase the number of services from London to Manchester and Birmingham from next Tuesday. Its timetable was slashed by nearly half over summer. The government has been accused of trying to buy off communities to garner support for fracking in England. The business secretary says restrictions introduced in 2019 over concerns about tremors near extraction sites will be lifted. Jacob Rees-Mogg suggested the process could become popular if firms paid residents for the inconvenience. Our correspondent, Ollie Barrett, says it's been a contentious issue within Parliament. We had Ed Miliband, the uh, Shadow Climate Change Secretary, he was able to secure this urgent question today in Parliament and he went for Jacob Rees-Mogg, describing fracking as a dangerous uh, fantasy. He accused him of trying to create a charter for earthquakes with regulations at the moment requiring work to stop if tremors are above 0.5 on the Richter scale. Jacob Rees-Mogg said that that could potentially be lifted to 2.5 on the Richter scale. And volunteers will be asked to help support England's NHS cope over the coming winter. The new Health Secretary's plans also include two-week targets to see a GP and more powers for pharmacists to prescribe certain medicines. £15 million will also be spent on an overseas recruitment drive. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 87 points at 71.49. The pound buys $1.12 and €1.14. LBC weather, rain for Wales and central and southern England tonight. Showers for Western Scotland with a low of seven. Outbreaks of rain in the southeast tomorrow. A mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers elsewhere and a high of 20 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Lottie Morley. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It is three minutes past eight on LBC. Uh, We're going to be streaming this hour on Global Player and YouTube if you'd like to watch us uh, because we have Christina McInnie with us, General Secretary of Unison, Britain's largest trade union, recently become Britain's largest trade union, I think, hasn't it? A few years ago. Was it? Was it? (laughs) See, I I still think a lot of people think United, (laughs) but uh, you've you've overtaken them. Now, the, the last time we spoke was a good few months ago, wasn't it? And a lot has changed in the political landscape and I think in the industrial landscape as well. It seems to me that we're sort of almost back in the late 1970s with high inflation, with lots of strikes or strikes being threatened. Do you see any analogy to the 1970s here? Well, I think that the analogy would be that the cost of living is really difficult now as it was back in the 70s. The the one single biggest difference is that now we have the toughest uh, trade union legislation in Europe and we have a government that's now threatening to make it even tougher. So you have to jump through 10, 12 hoops to be able to take legal industrial action now, uh, which you didn't have to necessarily in in the 1970s. But I think genuinely it's definitely a bottom-up thing. This isn't uh, trade union leaders sitting in a room trying to direct strikes. This is our members telling us uh, in no uncertain terms that they want something done about their pay. And so it's it feels much, it feels very organic, which it did in the seventies as well. I mean, I don't, I wasn't a member. <laughs> I'm still at school, but <laughs> um, 
but it feels like you know that that's I think that's the comparison is that mm. people do genuinely feel their lives are at threat, their lives are and their families' lives are at risk of you know how can they feed their children, how can they how can they plan for any major catastrophe like uh, you know needing to replace a tire in your car or your your boiler breaking down because that people just don't have any money in reserves. Um. The number to call if you'd like to put a question to Christina, she's going to be with me until nine o'clock, is 0345 6060 973. We'll have a chat for a few minutes before we come to the calls. Um, you are balloting, or your union is balloting for strike action in the NHS. Just explain what that's all about. So our ballot opens in Scotland on the 3rd of uh, October, and at the end of October we will be opening a ballot, in, a formal industrial action ballot, for our NHS members in uh, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Now that means by then we'll be balloting about 400,000 members, which is probably the biggest ballot uh, uh, certainly at this point. And what fields are they in within the NHS? So uh, we, don't, we don't recruit doctors, but everything else so from senior managers porters, cleaners, administrative staff and we're the second biggest nurses union and we also have occupational therapists and a whole range of others um, so we're doing this because of the offer that's been made so in, at a time when inflation's running around 10% our members in Scotland have been offered a 5% increase across the board and our members in England, Wales and Scotland uh, sorry, England, Wales and Northern Ireland have been offered a flat rate not offered, it's a, it's a pay review body in England, Wales and Northern Ireland and they've been offered a flat rate of £1,400, which, when you think of what's happened to energy prices, the more money that people are having to pay out on energy, fuel costs, food prices, that is completely wiped out. And for um, most of those bands, which are where the professional staff, nurses, uh, physios, midwives, occupational therapists would be, it represents about a 4 to 4.2% increase, which in effect is meaning they're taking a 6% pay cut. But has the 5% offer in Scotland been accepted? No. So that's where ballot, our ballot there opens in the 3rd of October. Right. I mean, it's, it's a dilemma, isn't it? Because I, mean, I do think back to the 70s here when inflation was m even higher than it is at the moment. And, of course, understandably, trade unions represent their members' interests and they, they want pay rises to keep pace with inflation. But it can become a bit of a vicious circle, can't it, where it's sort of the pay rises actually fuel inflation. I'm sure that economically can happen, but that's not what's happening at this point in time. And you know, even you know, all the sort of economists will tell you that uh, eighty percent of the inflation that we're currently dealing with is coming from energy costs and mm. um, uh, just you know other other types of increases. It's not coming from from pay. That is not the main driver of inflation at the moment. It's actually working people that are having to deal with the cost of inflation rather than there being the cause of it. And actually, I mean, wage inflation should be happening. Now now, given that there are so many vacancies in the economy and not enough people to fill them. So that ought to be a driver of higher wages anyway, I would have thought. You would think, wouldn't you? <laughs> so we have, If you were doing your job properly, Christine, if you would, obviously. <laughs> or if the government would actually listen to evidence. Um, so, yeah, we've got around about 140,000 vacancies in the NHS in this country and around about 160,000 vacancies in the care sector. In turnover rates in the care sector between 30 and 40 percent that means three or four out of ten people leaving mm. every single year now that is a huge impact on the services that they're providing and then at the same time um you know if only the government listened to, to it. so we have hard evidence of this that that's what's actually happening and um and yet we have this mad announcement well, i consider it a mad announcement of uh um removing the cap on bankers' bonuses because we're losing a few high-wage individuals to Hong Kong or Singapore or wherever it is they're going to go to. On what evidence? And what will the impact of that be? And can you really not recruit high-paid bankers? I find that I, hard to believe. I thought the part of the reasoning was not that bankers are leaving, but was to attract bankers from European financial centres who would still be subject to the, to the cap because of the EU directive. Oh, I thought they were saying that they were losing good people. Maybe it is that they're not coming here and they're losing good people, but have they produced any evidence for that? Have there any figures? Uh, you know, I, I mean, has anyone done some research into it? what difference will it make if you bring in people from different countries who who would who would still come and work here? Because let's be honest, London's a very attractive city. I mean, I, I say this as a Scot living who's been living here for over thirty years. I love London and. Lots of people in, in well-paying jobs like to come to London, like to come and work. It's like London, Paris, New York, you know. 
Um, so I, I find it very hard, uh, unless somebody produces some evidence that shows me that actually they can't recruit these bankers and not being able to recruit them is a major problem for, the, for, for our country. I, I think it's to make a point on Brexit, actually, more than more than anything, in that sort of that they would see this as a as a positive thing, something that we couldn't have done if we were still in the EU. And I mean, let's face it: three years after leaving the EU, they they need to be able to point to things that they've they've done which we wouldn't have been able to do before. But politically, I mean, it's tin eared, isn't it? Well, how many people care whether they? I mean, in the long and 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 the. In, you know, in reality, whether they remove the bankers' bonuses doesn't really make that much difference because, or remove the cap on it, because all that's happened is most of the, the financial institutions have compensated for that by paying higher salaries uh, to cover for the mm. fact that they can't pay them um, higher bonuses. So the reality is, if that's what they think is how they prove they're delivering on Brexit, it's a very sad day. I mean, we're, we're still nowhere near the kind of trade deals that we were promised that actually would make a difference to people's lives. Uh, and yet they, I mean, it just feels, I don't know who's advising them, but for this to be their first, one of their first big major policy announcements is just utterly bizarre. Are, I mean, obviously big trade unions are involved in lots of disputes all over the country. Some maybe very small will never hit the headlines. But are, are you noticing now that most of these disputes are about pay rather than any other aspect of working life? Predominantly about pay, but they don't always present as a dispute or a, or a strike so for example one of the areas where we've in unison managed to get and i'm talking millions and millions of pounds for um for healthcare assistance i'll use that as an example in the in the, the nhs is what we call a rebanding claim a regrading claim so basically you're going in and you're using job evaluation to say they're, they're getting paid this rate because it's on an old job description and actually this is what they do and they should be paid at this rate. And we've been hugely successful in it. We haven't had to take strike action. We have had disputes about it. And we just won in a big trust in, in, in Manchester recently. Uh, and, and this is just one trust. We got £16 million in back pay because uh, people had been getting paid at the right level. And that's replicated across uh, lots of workplaces. And these are predominantly low-paid women who for years hadn't been getting the right rate of pay. So not everything, res not all of the uh, the successes that we have uh, depend on strike action. So yeah, it's, it, you wouldn't say this is necessarily, this was about getting job recognition, recognition for the job they do, but the end result is you're getting more pay for pay more money in people's pay packets. Um, a text question here. Somebody says, could you please ask Christina if she thinks the union should get their acts together and have a general strike of public sector workers, given that they're all being neglected by the government? So we do coordinate. We've always coordinated. And in the, in the NHS, there's 14 major trade unions, and we are all talking about timetables and ballots. You know, the, the Royal College of Nursing are taking strike action or balloting for strike action for the first time in their history. Uh, Unite, GMB, we're all talking to each other about coordinating within sectors, the same in local government, the same in, you know, higher education, you name a sector, transport, we are transport, trains. we're all talking to each other. Um, I, the general strike, I think you'll note that no, I don't think any general secretary has called for a general strike because of the legislation and the legislative framework that we've got, which is if a strike is deemed to be unlawful, which... Uh, you know, we we've certainly taken some legal advice on this, and you know, um, but anything you do that's deemed unlawful means that all of a trade union's funds can be sequestered, which means they all disappear, or they're, they're put into you know you lose basically you lose your union, and even more worrying is those who take part in the strike lose any protection, so they can all be dismissed en masse, uh, and you would lose any protection that you get from the current um, legislation for taking lawful industrial action. So that, that's partly why. But in terms of working together and coordinating, absolutely, we're all committed to it. And we've, we're have we taking a motion to the Trade Union Congress this year, myself and, and uh, Unite, our, our union and Unite, both calling for the same thing. So we are absolutely committed to working with our you know, sister unions across the UK to make sure that we can make a difference to people. What, what difference does it make to have the two biggest unions led by women? Uh, if any. Well, it's hard for me to say what the difference has been. Uh, Sharon and I were both elected relatively close to each Sharon other. Graham from Sharon Unite. Graham, sorry, yeah. from Unite. And yeah, we we're in touch. We talk. We talk often. We'll be meeting at. I'm sure at the Labour Party and at the TUC. Um, 
And we have fairly common interests, which is we want to see um, our unions focusing very much on outcomes for members. And that no, that's not to say we're not concerned about international issues or, you know, um, uh, human rights issues, but that's our key well, primary well, focus. Let, let me give you two differences, which I, I think have been apparent to me. Maybe I'm unique in this, but I think that the whole debate, the industrial debate, has become much less belligerent in that you're both... You, you're not. You don't come from this. These sort of. I mean, Sharon can do a bit of fire branding if she, if she wants to. But I I sort of sense that there's that the language is is different, and that you 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 both seem to be a bit less political than your predecessors in, in terms of sort of constantly talking about the Labour Party. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I think we both got elected on on mandates which were about let's keep the focus on what happens in the union and how we deliver for members, not I want to run the Labour Party. But I, I, and when you say what difference does it make to, to have women, again, round the, in the past year, there's been a new general secretary of the uh, GMB, a um, guy called Gary Smith. Um, so it's a man who's been elected, but actually Gary comes from pretty much the same position that we are. I work closely with Gary. We, um, I'd say, we probably share a similar vision in terms of where we want our unions, our unions to be, and how we want to deliver for members. So, it's, I think maybe it's not so much. Well, I'm sure there is an element about the fact that that, that the culture changes when there's more women involved, but um, I think equally it's a, just a kind of new new breed coming through. Mm. Um, because certainly and, I can see that. And a new breed who are willing to do things like this, to come on programmes like this, to sort of promote what, what you're doing. Because that's, it's a bit like in the last hour we were talking about why does nobody from the fracking industry come, go on the media? <laughs> and uh, I mean, I'm not comparing you with frackers, by the way. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? Yeah. It, you can't expect people to understand what you do if you don't tell them what you do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You have to be uh, be able to communicate your message. And... Mm. Um, uh, I mean, I I think general general secretaries in the past have done that, um, but that's something I see that as a very important part of my job is to deliver the message as well and be a spokesperson for for my union. Right, we're going to go to some calls in a moment. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. If you'd like to talk to uh, Christina, she's general secretary of Unison, which is Britain's biggest trade union. You can text your questions to eight four eight five zero or tweet at LBC. It's seventeen minutes past eight. This is LBC. Ian Dale on LBC. 
19 minutes past eight on LBC. If you want to watch us, you can do so on Global Player and on the LBC YouTube channel. Christina McInnie is with me, General Secretary of Unison, Britain's biggest trade union, 0345 6060 973, if you'd like to give us a call. Or if you can't call us, you can text us on 84850. Uh, ben in Haringey is on the line. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ian. And um, is it Teresa or me? Ma- Christina. Christina. Have you not been listening? Uh, no, I, 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 it's my fault uh, for a misunderstanding. Uh, Christina, hello, Christina. Um, oh. A question of the question I've got. Um, I was uh, branch secretary of the GMB in Haringey Borough for twelve years, and I'm very moderate. Um, I very seldom. I mean, I've been a trade union member for fifty five years and been on strike for two days. Out of that whole lot, so the image of trade unions must change because uh, it's it's more like a, a help club th- than anything else nowadays, as well as trying to negotiate with difficult employers. But anyway, the question is: if the government, if tra- if she brought in, um, Liz Truss brought in her threat to stop strikes and bring in a law to stop strikes, what would the reaction of the whole trade union movement to that? I mean, this is news to me that she wants to bring in a law to ban strikes. Well, she during her campaign, she was talking about that sort of thing. And, uh, mm, you know, it I was think, mentioned think, during her interview as well. Yeah, she didn't actually say she wanted to ban strikes. I think she said something about having a sort of minimum service level, like on, on uh, in the, the public sector areas, like trains, for example, that there would have to be a certain amount of trains that would run. But that that's not quite the same as banning strikes, is it, Ben? Well, that means that a certain amount of the staff would be banned for going on strike. Well, uh, Christina, what do you think? Yeah, there is an element of that. Um, I mean, to be honest, the the sectors that I that I represent, uh, my, my 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 union represents, like the NHS, like the care service or social workers, etc. We would always have minimum service levels anyway, and uh, actually. You know, I don't know if she's spoken to anybody about the law of un- unintended consequences, but uh, we've been calling for minimum service levels in the NHS for years, and they've always res- totally resisted putting in minimum staffing levels. Um, so, uh, but I think the difficult, I think it's all about the mood music she's sending out, which is one of the first things she was saying was about trying to stop unions, calling us irresponsible. Um, and it's, so it's about the minimum service levels, but it's also about making. She's going to shift the the the, uh, the percentages that you need to get <clears throat> in order to have a strike. And as I said earlier, we already have probably the toughest um, legislation in Europe in terms of how you, how you can take strike action and and be lawful strike action. Um, so I, we have, the TUC has already set up a group to look. We don't know what the, the legislation will look like, but we wanted to get our act together early, well, so we've soon, set up a group to look at it. You soon will, because apparently she's promised to introduce minimum service levels on critical national infrastructure, introducing primary legislation in the first 30 days of government. So mm. on that basis, it would need to be by the end of this month, wouldn't it? Um, and ensure strike action has significant support from union members by raising the minimum threshold for voting in favour of strike action from 40 to 50 percent yeah i mean she didn't get 50 percent of the electorate to get elected as prime minister so it's a bit rich i think um but yeah i mean she and the thing is whilst they say that and you might think that sounds reasonable that's they're not interested in participation because what they won't do which we've been asking for for years is change it from being an electoral a, a postal ballot to making it an online ballot and we've even offered to pay for it. Trade unions have said we'll 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 pay for it. You can have it overseen by whatever body you want. We just want to make it more accessible what, what to members. What do they give? For they that? don't. They don't give one. They just say no. We're not doing it. Um, and it is because they know that if you're stuck with a, a postal ballot for things like strike action, that it's more difficult. People get a, they get an envelope. They're told to fill it in, put it across, put it back in the the post box. It, it's, the ballot might be open for three or four weeks. It sits behind the clock on the mantelpiece. They forget about it. Um, and they won't do anything to work with us to make to make it easier to communicate with, with members. So I think it's, it's a bit hypocritical of them to start saying that this is about trying to improve uh, membership participation. Ben, thank you for that. A text question from Lucy in Doncaster. Do you think Keir Starmer has turned his back on the unions? Uh, no, not at all. Um, 
Uh, I mean, we've got Labour Party starting on Sunday. I'll be there. Um, I'll be there too in Liverpool. <laughs> yeah, Liverpool. Um, uh, I mean, they're the Labour Party. They want to be running the country. Uh, and I think the difference between them and the, the Conservatives, I would see, is they don't see us as necessarily the, the enemy or part of the problem. And I'd say this of all of the strikes at the moment is... Going on strike is a symptom of a problem. It doesn't cause the problem. And I, I get the feeling that Liz Trust and our, and our, our, our colleagues don't, don't see that at all. And what I think is Keir Starmer does see that. I, I would hope he sees that anyway. That doesn't mean we'll always agree with him. And I'm pretty sure next week there'll be some pretty feisty debates and dis- disagreements over some fairly critical issues. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're already in discussion with them about some of these things. So it's not that there's a cosy relationship between us. In my view, um, we will do what we can to support uh, Labour because we are an affiliated trade union. But that doesn't mean we support absolutely everything they see. How, they, how often do you meet Keir Starmer? Not that often. If you, you know, when was the last time? The last time I spoke to him over the summer. I haven't seen him. When did I last see him? I honestly can't remember. But I mean, not that long ago. Maybe a, a month ago or something like this. Um, but I don't see him reg. I mean, I don't see him every week or anything like that. I mean, you're talking about uh, when there's a big issue on or something like that. We might meet up, or we might he might phone me, or I might phone him about something. But we're not in daily contact or weekly contact or anything like that. But we are, and we, you know, we have a we have a political department within Unison, and they're in touch with the Labour Party, and but it, it varies across the UK as well. So, uh, I think what's interesting, if you look at what happened in Scotland, where we were doing um, pay negotiations a few weeks ago on local government pay, and we had two weekends of intense negotiations involving the unions and the employers, but also involving the Scottish government, and in fact, in the second, was this the Edinburgh bin strike. It was that is that was part of it. I mean, it was much wider than the Ben Strait, but because it was Edinburgh during the festival, that's what mm. got coverage. Um, Luckily, I'd left Edinburgh by that point. <laughs> <laughs> but Nicola Sturgeon came into the final the final knockings of the negotiations. Like, can you imagine Liz Truss coming into negotiations if we've got a, a strike in health? I can't. Well, the interesting thing is that, in contrast to Grant Shapps, the new transport secretary, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, one of the first things she did was ring up Mick Lynch and say, come in for a meeting. And so th- 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 there may be, I mean, obviously you can't say that's going to be necessarily across the government, no. but certainly in that dispute, there seems to be at least a willingness to, to involve the, the government. Well, I wrote to uh, Liz Truss, I think, the day after she got elected, congratulating her and offering to meet her, saying I'd like to, to meet her to talk about some of the issues that have come up. I've heard nothing. Granted, it was only a few weeks ago and we've had the Queen's funeral. I expect she's been a bit busy. Um, but I would hope she'll respond positively to that because I would certainly be happy to go and meet her. And I know Frances O'Grady, who's the General Secretary mm. of the TUC, would definitely be happy to get in and talk to any of them. Beer and sandwiches in number 10, or what would you suggest? Should <laughs> I'm, be on not the menu? A great, I'm not a big beer fan, so hopefully not beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, let's go to Andrew in Woodford. Hello, Andrew. Yes, hello. Let me just get off a... Yeah, I was around uh, in the 70s when the uh, unions had a stranglehold uh, on the country, having extreme conditions, extreme uh, pay rises, uh, and taking over everything. The unions then lost uh, all favour, well, a lot of favour from the public uh, and a lot of favour from just about everyone. And there's all the union laws being bought in. How have the unions changed and adapted and, rec- and uh, uh, changed from the 70s so they're back uh, as a strong unit without being scorned and without being remembered of, of what damage they did back then? People have long memories, don't they, Christine? Yeah, although I have to say I don't agree with his analysis at all, I'm afraid, of what happened in the 70s. And I think if you think you back... You weren't there. Well, I was at school and I, I was, you know, I was away, I have read back on some of these things. I mean, um, I, I was there and I think Andrew's got some important points there. Well, I'm trying to think back to... Um, I was, I was in Glasgow when the UCS dispute started, the Upper Clyde Shipbuilders. And that was about that was a set that was a work in where what they were trying to do the government had Ted Heath's government came in and said uh, they weren't going to fund failing industries as they called it even though their order books were full 
Um, and the workers got together and did a, a, a work in and eventually they did go get money invested into shipbuilding again. Now they were doing that not just to save jobs but because this was to save local communities as well. I lived, I grew up in an area called Drumchapel in Glasgow, which is very close to the Clyde. And I'd say there wasn't a single family that I knew that didn't have some connection with shipbuilding, whether it was a father, brother, sister, uncle, cousin, somebody knew somebody who worked in the shipbuilding. And if that had been allowed to just close uh, in one big bang like that, it would have utterly devastated those communities. So I don't think the trade unions back in the 70s were as bad as some people are painting them. Uh, and some of the trade union legislation we've had, uh, some of the worst bits of it, haven't necessarily been in response to what happened in the 70s, but were no, in response to what that, happened That's true, but but I, I think back to those mass meetings at British Leyland where people would stick two hands mm -hmm. up to, to have a vote. I think of the flying pickets that existed. I think, of, I think yep. of the closed shop. Now, I mean, you're not arguing to go back to those days. I completely understand that, but that's where Andrew's coming from. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying everything was perfect back then, but when I look back at some of the things, and when I speak to people who were involved in some of these disputes, one side of it is to look at flying pickets, the other side is to look at the way some people were damaged and and uh, assaulted by sometimes by police. And you know, we can't pretend that didn't happen. It did happen. And uh, communities were devastated and have, have it's taken generations to try and recover some of those communities because they were allowed to fail. I mean, ju just on that, Andrew, I mean, that, that's an important point, isn't it? I, I was interviewing Michael Brown, the former MP for Brig and Cleethorpes earlier today for my All Talk podcast, and he was relating a day back in, I think, 1980, when 10,000 of his constituents were issued redundancy notices on the same day. Now, when that kind of thing happens, you can't blame organised labour for tr trying to fight it, can you? No, I don't blame that, but I do also remember uh, unions beating up other union, union uh, members uh, and the scabs because they crossed picket lines. You were saying about the flying pickets. Uh, they They were getting involved with other people's disputes. Of course, I, I agree 100% of the principle of the unions, but I don't believe in uh, that one union gangs up with another union, which has nothing, nothing to do with them, and brings everyone out on strike, and the people do not have, a cho uh, do not have any options. I, I remember that with the winter of discontent, uh, big, uh, how Britain was basically brought to its knees but by the unions, I remember 31% pay rises that the unions uh, the demanded. Otherwise, uh, other, <laughs> otherwise they, uh, like the, the miners, that tried to uh, cut, the, cut the power. Now, that does not endear people towards unions because they just had too yeah. much power. But, but this, this would, was... Would, the, would, 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 would this... The, uh, we're, this, we're, uh, we're to, we're to, Andrew, we're talking about 40 or 50 years ago, and I think even you would have to admit that trade unions have changed over that time. You might say, well, they've been forced to change because of the legislation. But I think in general, I, I, I think it, it's not just about settling pay disputes or demanding higher pay. Uh, we, we've had various trade union leaders on this programme explaining that being a member of a trade union is not all about negotiating higher pay. It's about health and safety. It's about sort of lots of other benefits. In fact, we might come on to that in a moment. But, Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Um, Neil says, the flying pickets. Now, there's a ban. <laughs> Only you could say that, Neil. <laughs> See what I did there? People from an older generation would. I'm not going to sing it. It's 8.33. Let's get some more calls in a moment. 0345 6060 News headlines with Lottie Morley. A recent rise in national insurance will be scrapped from November. Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng confirmed the move ahead of his mini-budget tomorrow. A third rail strike has been announced in the space of eight days next week. 40,000 members of the RMT union will also walk out on the 8th of October in the row over pay, jobs and conditions. And volunteers will be asked to help support England's NHS cope over the coming winter. The new health secretary's plans also include two-week targets to see a GP and more powers for pharmacists to prescribe certain medicines. LBC weather, rain for Wales in central and southern England tonight, showers for western Scotland and a low of seven degrees. LBC.
Leading Britain's conversation. Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.36. I've just received a really, really sad email from Sandra. She says, you may recall a month or so ago speaking to my son, Ryan Geraghty. He rang to discuss euthanasia. He was a sergeant major in the army and had been diagnosed with cancer nine months ago. <sighs> he sadly died four weeks ago. He's having a military funeral next Wednesday at Salisbury Cathedral. He was a great fan of yours, and I just wanted to let you know he was only 38. That is so sad, Sandra. Um, I do remember the conversation, and it, it was a very moving conversation, and I, I'm really sorry for your loss. Um, Christina McInerney is with us. Gen I'm just trying to gather myself. Uh, General Secretary of Unison. Uh, we're streaming this hour on Global Player and on YouTube. 0345 973 is the number to call. Let's take a text from Mark who says, I get that people want an inflation matching pay rise, but what happens when energy prices level back out and inflation drops? Will those same people be happy to take the equivalent pay cut? Uh, can I just pass on my condolences to Sandra? Obviously, I didn't didn't speak to her or anything, but that, that's really sad to hear yeah, about really losing, is. losing your child. Every parent's worst nightmare. Um, yeah. So, well, I think the fact that uh, I have to put the pay increases in context. We've had um, since 2010, we've had either well, actually, since about 2009, we've had either pay freezes or incredibly low pay increases, below inflation pay increases across the public sector. Uh, so even if we got an inflation proofed pay increase this year um, and inflation goes back down next year, it, it's still, unless they're going to give us about 30% this year, which I think is extremely unlikely, we'll still be underpaid from what we should have been if we'd kept in line with inflation since 2010 or 2009. So I suspect people won't be giving it back. Um, uh, and I don't suppose he was serious in asking that. Poss possibly not. Um, right, here's one from Zach. I've never joined a union, never known anybody who has, and if I'm brutally truthful, probably spent my adult life drinking the anti-union Kool-Aid. I've been quite <coughs> ignorant, giving in to the stereotypes and clichés surrounding strike action. Listening to your warming guest, I think that's a, that must be... Warming guest? Have you ever been described as warming before? <laughs> I'm not quite sure that's the word he's looking for. Um, has widened my right of centre worldview on unions and at some of their victories for everyday working men and women. That 60 million back pay win is tremendous. What a considered and relatable woman. Is there a union for freelance graphic designers? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there is equity or NUJ or something, probably. I think it is NUJ, actually, yeah. Um, do, do you find this a lot, though, that there's still... I mean, we heard it from Andrew there, where people just have this this view of what a union is, and, and you can talk till you're blue in the face, and you're not even going to convince them that anything has changed. Yeah, all, all the time. And you even hear it from uh, government ministers and people in the media. They'll, they'll still talk about trade union barons, and I think they have this well, idea... Well, baronesses of, now. Well, they don't, they don't <laughs> say that, though, do they? <laughs> and yet, well, one, one day... <laughs> when... Um, you know, the reality is, if you think about trade unions at the moment, probably at least half of everyone who's a trade union member is, is in a union that's led by a woman. Uh, but that's never factored in when you hear people talking about it. Uh, so, yeah, there is still this stereotype of uh, a shouty man. Um, uh, I mean, to be honest, that hasn't been allowed, apart from one or two individuals, that, that hasn't been the reality for a long time. Uh, I mean, my predecessor was a man. He certainly wasn't a shouty man. He was a very considered, um, articulate uh, campaigner and, and negotiator and um, and was able to do that without banging a table or anything. So, um, yeah, there is still that stereotype out there that that's what trade unions do, that we're all about saying no to things, when in actual fact... Um, if you speak to some of the employers that I that we deal with in Unison, uh, they will tell you that actually unions are a real force for, you know, for good. Even if we don't always agree with them, if you've got a problem in the workplace, it makes it much easier to be able to pick up the phone to an experienced, trained trade union person at the end of a phone who, and say, "We're having a big major restructure and we don't think it's going to go down well with staff. Can we talk about it?" And the union will talk talk to them. Now we might not reach agreement, but we might be able to say to them, "Have you thought about doing it this way?" Um, and the same, you know, disciplinaries or grievances. If you've got an experienced trade union person there, most employers will tell you it makes their life much easier. 
Let's just spend two minutes talking about what you do apart from arguing for bigger pay rises. <laughs> so uh, in my union, we have um, one of the key things we do is um, we work a lot on education and training. And uh, by that, I mean, we so I launched when I became general secretary, a thing called the Unison College, which is not a physical building. It's just an extension of some of the learning that we'd pre previously been doing and sort of shifted the emphasis a bit. So we provide training on three levels for all of our act for all of our members, which is and we've given a guarantee that everyone can have access to at least a part of this, which is um, support on and advice on trade union training. That's one part of it. But the other two parts of it are about professional and personal development. So we're investing in that. We're doing a lot of work. And many of our members uh, may have left school with very little in the way of formal qualifications. Uh, and actually being becoming, and it's the same for lots of unions, and becoming a trade union activist or getting some training can absolutely be life-changing for people because they suddenly discover that they have all these skills that they didn't know they had. So that's that's a key thing for us. We do lots of work on um, some anti-poverty issues and we have our own charity and we provide support for people. Um, and a big part of what we do is to work with third sec you know, other organisations about trying to raise issues around poverty, but also around sort of human rights issues. We do lots of work internationally as well. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in contact for example with the independent Ukrainian trade unions at the moment we work with them we our unions uh, we put out an appeal our union was probably one of the first in fact they've, they've name checked us to say this loads of our branches donated money to Ukraine it became a big issue uh, you know we campaign against uh, um, human rights abuses across the globe so there's lots of things that we do which is not just about uh, paying see, conditions again, I think this is this is a I'm sure unions have done a lot of those things since time immemorial, yeah, yeah. but we don't hear about them. But I think back in the day, you would have had UK trade unions supporting sort of freedom for Angola, that's, that sort of thing. Um, whereas nowadays, I think it's much more targeted and I think can enjoy much wider public support. Let's go to another call. Robin is in Whitehaven. Hello, Robin. Hello, Ian. Hi, what would you uh, like to say? Um, I'd just like to um, get the view... Um, from the General Secretary um, on proportional representation and whether she would support the um, that and would she press Keir Starmer to get the Labour Party to be calling for PR, basically. Um, personally, I'd like to see it. Um, well, apparently, someone was telling me there are more motions on PR at the Labour conference than any other subject, which shows what a boring conference it's going to be then, <laughs> if that's if that's the case. Angela Rayner was on the News Agents podcast with Emily Maitlis, John Sopel and Lewis Goodall yesterday, was it the day before. Fantastic interview, I have to say, one of the best political interviews I've ever heard. Um, and she was saying that she does not agree with PR, that she believes in first past the post. What about you? So, interestingly, at our conference in June, for the first time, Unison carried a motion supporting PR. So we now have an official position to support proportional representation. Uh, and that will obviously influence how we vote next week at the Labour Party. Um, you know, I can see the personally can see pros and cons for it. Um, uh, but I think if you look at places like the Scottish Parliament where they've they've had that for some time now. But it's so what we so what we're saying is we support it in principle, but we haven't said what form of PR it should be and I think there's a lot more work needs to be done to work out, mm. you know, what kind I, of PR. I'm sensing would work that better. maybe you're not quite on board with your own union's policy on this. No, no, I am actually <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think it is worth exploring. I definitely think right. it's worth exploring. And that and we're committed to that, so we'll be pushing for that. In I mean, the it's part. interesting because I, I don't think Keir Starmer is, is on board with it and if Angela Rayner isn't either that's, uh, that might be quite an interesting debate. Having said it might be rather boring earlier. Yeah well I suppose for politicians that I mean you know you'll know this better than me you know there's that kind of feeling that um, first past the post means you have certainty rather than trying to go for some kind of compromise if you have to have a you, know, you get a hung parliament and you have different, mm. different groups trying to 
and you can look you, there is lots of examples as well where um, trying to get coalitions can take forever uh, so I can see why people, why politicians... In Belgium, it took looking. 10 months to form a government, <laughs> but apparently the Belgian economy performed much better than it normally did. At, <laughs> so there's a lesson to be drawn there somewhere, there isn't is. there? Right, keep your calls coming. 0345 606973. You can text your question to 84850. It's 846. LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. See, this is why you should watch on Global Player. Danny says, for those of us watching on Global Player, we just saw Ian Dale wipe his nose as soon as the break started. <laughs> See? What an incentive, eh? <laughs> at least it wasn't Christina. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> right, Christina McInerney is with us answering your question. She's General Secretary of Unison, 0345 6060 973. John is in Prestwick in Scotland. Hello, John. Hi, Ian. It's John here in Preston. Hi. Uh, Christina, um, I want to ask you about affiliation to the Labour Party. Uh, the Labour Party in Scotland is a minority party. Uh, yesterday's opinion polls showed that 52% of people in Scotland were in favour of independence. That means they would either vote for uh, the SNP or the Alba Party or the Green Party. So why why are you affiliated to the Labour Party? And is not that in conflict with the general opinion of your members in Scotland who would probably not vote Labour? And consequently, there's a, a dilemma there for your affiliation. Now, I speak as a, a, a person who was a shop steward for Nalgo in the old days and also a Labour Party councillor. And I'm now a member of the SNP. So there's a, there's, a, there's a problem here with your affiliation. And you seem to be, by affiliating continually to the Labour Party, alienating most of your uh, members who would ordinarily not vote Labour. So can you explain this to me? So um, it's, a, it's an excellent point, actually. Um, historically, we've always been affiliated to the Labour Party. And... 
Uh, you'll know this as you were in, in Nalgo. I was I once I was the women's officer for Nalgo at one point. Yes, I remember um, you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, well, you'll know this that decisions like that about who we affiliate to are taken by conference. They're not taken by me or by any general secretary. And if there was a move to change that, then that's what would happen. Uh, as again, I'm sure you're aware of this. We are. We try and be, I think, very sensitive about the issues, not just in, in Scotland, but in, in Northern Ireland too, where there isn't a Labour Party. And um, so there are certain things that maybe don't always happen in, in those parts of the union. And we are in credit. I completely accept what you're saying. Our membership in Scotland so, is just as reflective of the, why, the, the why, workforce. Why, to be fair, why, why, to be fair, do you not affiliate to both the Labour Party and the Scottish National Party? And the Conservative Party. And, 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 and the Liberal Democrats. And, the, well, and Uncle Tom Cobley. Well, Ian, well, Ian I'll, I'll, I'll go with you on that one. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it just, I mean, it, there, is, there is clearly a dilemma here because... The majority, of, I, I would imagine that the majority of your members would support uh, independence in Scotland uh, by by any standard. So uh, you, you're you're alienating many of your members, and I would think you need to maybe broaden your broaden your uh, your outlook. Well, I, I'd say. Um... As I said, we're trying to be sensitive to the way we do things in Scotland um, and the, the language we use and when we talk about governments, etc. But the fact is, it's it's our members that decide what they want to, who they want to affiliate to. And people don't have to tick the box that says affiliate to the Labour Party. So we only affiliate those numbers where people have ticked a box that says they want to affiliate to the Labour Party. Um, and you're right, in Scotland, I'm sure... But why not uh, have a box so you could make a donation to other parties as well? Because, because I mean... It, it's in our rules that we are part of... We're affiliated to the Labour Party, not right. any other party. And that would have to change for that to... You know, the Labour Party is part of the Labour movement and mm. that's what we are. But but I, I accept the point that you're making, which Church. is that we, you know, most of our members, they're just like the rest of the electorate in Scotland. Uh, but actually, I, I don't know that we're alienating them that much because actually it's our fastest growing region at the moment. We're putting on loads of members. So. What do you put that down to? Well, I think it's partly down to the, the negotiations we've just been involved in on um, local government and right. the deal that we've, well, we're out for consultation on it at the moment. Um, Paul in Westminster, it's a slightly allied point here. He says, in a past job, there was no union. So I went to join a generic union. I went through the rules to sign up to find that I couldn't be a member of the Conservative Party and the union. In my mind, the two are compatible. But why don't unions see it that way? Obviously, I ended up not joining the union. Uh, well, that's not a rule in my part in my union, so I'm pretty. I don't know what union. I actually would have haven't ever heard of that. I've before. never. I don't think that's lawful. Actually, I think I'd be incredibly surprised if you were allowed to Go do on, that. Paul, text me again and tell me which union it was. We'd love to know. Uh, Jeff is in Woking. Hi, Jeff. Hello, Ian, and hello, Christina. Um, hello. Christina, how concerned should working people? in this country be about the rhetoric coming from the new cabinet regarding uh, the dilution, if you like, of working conditions. Uh, obviously, pay is very important, but working conditions, I think, are equally as imp important. And, and, I, and I wonder what you feel about the, the rhetoric coming from the cabinet. At the but moment. be more specific. What do you mean by the rhetoric on working conditions? Well, uh, the, the, Conditions that have been gained over the years through not only the trade union movement, but also uh, European legislation regarding things like uh, holidays, working hours, paternity leave, maternity leave. But we've uh, always had higher conditions than the EU minimum standards. Well, a lot of them have been gained through the EU and uh, through the trade union movement. Well, the, 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 this government, this cabinet, it seems to be wanting to dilute these uh, uh, conditions. But be specific. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I haven't heard of any proposals to do, dilute maternity or paternity leave or pay or anything like that. But there has been, if you don't mind me, there has been a, um, a talk about a bonfire of red tape, which always rings some alarm bells in me because, for me, I think that probably means things like health and safety legislation because we're always been told we're you know people joke about health and safety but actually it's it's how you stop people being injured and killed at work and and a range of other things that I think when they talk about that uh, I, I I share uh, your caller's concern that actually what that does mean will be attack on trade union rights and workers rights 
Um, and although they have said initially, uh, I think she, she um, Liz Trust has said she won't repeal the working time direct or she won't change it. Um, let's just say we're at the, you know, the jury's still out on that. We're very sceptical about that. And I think that's something they probably will come after. But in terms of holidays, holiday entitlement, holiday pay, sick pay, <coughs> maternity pay, paternity pay, leave, I, I haven't heard any sort of hints that they would touch any of those. Well, they haven't been specific about it, but they are, as I say, this it's a bit of an old chestnut that we get a lot, or red tape is what stops, uh, you know, stops business from expanding, and what they often mean by that, what politicians sometimes mean by that is uh, things that stop employers doing just what they want without any, you know, any restrictions on them whatsoever. Jeff, thank you. Uh, let's move on to Fraser in Glasgow. A lot of Scottish callers today. Hello, Fraser. <laughs> Yeah, hiya. I just wondered what your plans are to kind of increase awareness uh, about union membership as an option for students, especially students on placements within health and social care settings who are very kind of vulnerable in comparison to uh, kind of fully fledged kind of paid up members of staff. Yep, we have uh, we we do have student members in unison. So, it, it, it's particularly in um, uh, in health and social care. So we have a, a whole we, we we go out and recruit student nurses, for example. We recruit people who are training to be social workers. We have a range of different bits where we will actually go out and recruit um, and offer a student rate f- to some to some parts to some groups within employment. Um, we work closely, you know. We do work with the NUA, so we're not trying to sort of compete with the National Union of Students on this. But, but that's a good point you make about what we should do with people. A lot of placement. people on my course and myself weren't really aware if it is an option. And if I if I knew it was an option, I would have saved myself lots of legal <laughs> sounds fees. Like, sounds if like you had a bad experience, fees. Fraser. Right. Um, let's just finish with a text question. How confident is Christina in this fiscal event that we're getting tomorrow? Will the government step up to the plate? Uh, um, I well, it's practically all been leaked, and no, I don't think they'll step up to the plate. I, I think very little of what they do tomorrow will actually help working people. When you think of some of the things that that's been trailed, um, I can't see any of it actually helping uh, you know, people going through a cost of living crisis. And I, my big worry about it is that we have uh, this is not subject to the um, uh, office of uh, what's it called budget responsibility, budget responsibility OBR. Uh, because they're not calling it a budget, they're calling it a fiscal event, which means there's no real scrutiny of it. And uh, I'm extremely worried about that, and I know other people have criticised it. It, I mean, we've got the Institute for Fiscal Studies, some of them saying that um, the plans look, as the the plans that have been trailed, the the tax cuts that have been talked about, uh, will actually um, leave a £60 billion hole in the, com- the government's finances, and some of the proposals will actually make the wealthy much richer and the poor poorer. And we have a Prime Minister, I think for the first time ever, um, there's no mask, there's no hiding things. <coughs> She's quite happy to say um, she doesn't believe that giving the rich more money is a bad thing and that she doesn't believe in redistribution. She thinks grow the cake, uh, not, um, not redistribute the cake. And she's relying on a pretty... Um, a, a, you know, a, a system of trickle down economics, which quite frankly hasn't worked very well up to now. And even President Biden, the President of the United States of America, has said that trickle down economics don't work. Christina, thank you very much for being with us over the last hour. If you missed any of the last hour, you can catch up on the whole show podcast or indeed on Global Player. Uh, In the next hour, we're going to talk about the violence and troubles that have erupted in Leicester and one or two other places in the Midlands over the past few days, uh, predominantly between Muslims and Hindus. We want to get to the bottom of why it's happening, what can be done to prevent further outbreaks of trouble, 